to the Lord. That's what prayer should be. And going through the Gospel of Mark this morning, the verses I, Lord willing, would like to begin with will be found in the fourth chapter of Mark, beginning with verse 21, 21 through 25. This is Jesus speaking, and he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed, and not to be put on it, or to set? to be set on a candlestick, for there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath, to him shall be given, and he that hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he hath. Those of you who are familiar with me and my preaching know that, pardon me, I've, this Sunday, today, will conclude 67 years that I've been trying to do this. Next Sunday will be the beginning of year number 68. You would think that an old geezer who's been at it that long would have it all worked out. And I am thankful to the Lord that on a, it seems like lately, regular basis, I, I, I use the term, I, I grew up in the country, so I use a lot of countryisms. And it's a, it's a hyperbole, but it gets the point across you get that shocking revelation that you just didn't expect. And I call it a two by four to the side of the head. You, you've heard that, haven't you? Well, the Lord gives me two by fours. And every time he does, he makes me like it. <laughs> I, I got a two by four. And it started with this lesson. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter five, if you want, keep your place and we'll take a look there. In verse 13, Jesus compared the disciples. The Sermon on the Mount is addressed to disciples. Look at the first two verses of the chapter. To the salt of the earth. And then beginning in verse 14, he said, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. A light on a hill. And Jesus, in the very next expression, added the comparison, a city set on a hill that cannot be hid is not the same as a candle in a house. They're both light. That's what they hold in common, but they're not the same. Jesus really introduced two lights, not one, in this lesson. In Mark's account, he focuses all of his thoughts on the light, the candle, and the house. Uh, candles in the first century that, that would have been actually used in this time were actually probably a small, maybe clay container. It would contain likely olive oil with a floating wick. And they didn't have, you know, pull the trigger igniters or strike a match to light them. It was not easy to light the candle. So once you lit it, pardon me, you wanted to protect it and keep it burning. And it was important to do that. What do you mean put it under the bed? In all likelihood, people then slept either on a mattress on the bed or on a very low lying bed. A candle under that bed, if it isn't snuffed out and makes a mess, is a fire danger, a big fire danger. 
people typically in eating meals, the, the, the table would be probably about that far, that, that elevated off the floor. There would be cushions, beds around the table, usually circular or oval, and you would lie on your side, face toward the table, and you would reach in to get your food and eat lying around the table. The equivalent, if that's the bed Jesus referred to, would for us be, do you light a candle and put it on the table or put a candle under the table? What good does it do under the table? We had a wonderful candle lit dinner with the candle under the table. <laughs> it, it doesn't it register, does it? Proper use of the candle lights up the house and everything inside it. A light on a, on a hill, a light that is visible for miles and miles away is not the same as the candle in the house. How do we get from A to B? That's a very interesting challenge. I find it fascinating that often in Scripture, house refers in biblical symbolism to your emotional, spiritual, moral, personal life and outlook on life. The house where you live is your thinking, your emotions, your feelings, how you make decisions, and what you decide. And when Jesus closed the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about two different houses. The person who hears his sayings and does them is like the man who builds his house on a rock. The storm comes, the winds blow. That's a solid house because it was built on a solid foundation. Hearing and doing, that's building your house, you see. And if you hear but don't do, he said, that's building your house on sand. Same storms, same winds, but that house doesn't stand. In 1 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 3, Paul says that he has built as a wise master builder and and. Every man's works, building your house, shall be tried as by fire, the test of fire to the building materials you use to build your house. If you choose, <laughs> all this change in weather has my throat a little acting up. I, I apologize. <clears throat> if you choose flammable materials to build your house, and, and that house gets tested by fire, you're in trouble. And he did describe it, hey, wood stubble. How's, how's that going to fare when the fire comes? Not good. But if you build gold or silver or precious stones, the fire's not going to hurt that. It's going to be preserved. Jesus, or, or Paul, makes a fascinating point at the conclusion of that lesson the house that is burned is going to destroy things that were important to the person who lived there. I've known of people, <laughs> pardon me, whose houses were burned. They lose so many precious things, whole photo albums that, of their life history that they have, mementos that, that are very valuable to their emotions. It's, it's a life-changing tragedy. And, and so Paul says, you know, this, this house is going to be burned, but he makes an, a fascinating observation. The house is burned up, but the man who, built, who lit, built the house and lives in the house is saved. This is not a going to heaven when you die passage. It's a how you live here and now passage. Your house gets burned up, but you're saved. You're saved, yet so as by fire. What does that mean? You had a great loss because you were building with the wrong materials. The description of a life of a believer who, does, who hears and doesn't build his life on the words and teachings of Jesus. So when Jesus talks about the light, he takes us the next step into this house. 
You're building your house. You're living in your house. Do you live with the light on or the light hidden? <clears throat> Tom Constable in the Sermon on the Mount text made a very practical observation. Salt as a natural substance prevents decay. I lived and grew up on a farm, a, a small farm where people <clears throat> tried to sustain themselves in every way possible. We would raise and fatten and kill and dress our own beef and our own pigs, pork. <clears throat> Dad would buy Morton's sugar curing salt and treat whole hams and whole sides of bacon and the shoulders of the pig with this salt compound and preserve it for the whole six or eight months or more that we would cut off and eat it. Salt preserves, it prevents decay. In the process, it is largely invisible. Constable suggests that it warns us of the danger of compromise or conformity in our lives. That's what decays our faith, isn't it? And then he identified light by its very design. We tend from a, a, a non-technical perspective to say light is seen, but you don't really see the light you see what the light exposes to your vision. Your eye is designed to receive the incoming light and to interpret the image of things that are exposed by the light or made manifest, as Paul says to Timothy. It represents a sense of illumination in a sin-darkened world. The big question that Jesus raises, and all of these passages contribute to the point, how do we order our life? Jesus' combination of salt and light says, don't compromise, but also don't isolate. Don't compromise your faith and conform to this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But at the same time, don't think you can have your faith and isolate yourself and never expose yourself and live in the association with other believers or talk about your faith to anyone else. Well, I don't go to church. I just, I, I have my faith and it's between me and God and it's none of anybody else's business. That's isolation. It doesn't work. You're ignoring the light and you will never be a light on a hill. One candle on a hill isn't even visible from any distance at all. It goes, it's completely out of vision entirely. We, we often talk about you're the light of the world. Christians think by the very fact that we're Christians, we're the light of the world. May I suggest that we're not the light of the world because we go to church on Sunday. The best we can do and the right thing all of these scriptures teach us to do is to make sure our house, where we live, how we live and how we make the decisions we make in life is governed by the light of the word of God, scripture. Jesus warned, you don't put a candle in a bushel. I, I guess in my naivete of first century Judah and, and Galilee, I thought of a bushel as a straw basket bushel would describe the size of the basket, a good size basket. More likely in the first century, it was clay, a clay pot. If you put the candle inside the clay pot, 
you, you would do that when you wanted, you, you were going to leave the house for a period of time and you didn't want to snuff out the candle and go through the ordeal of relighting it when you came back. So you'd put it in a safe place where if anything happened to it, it wouldn't ignite the house and burn your house down. How many times do we as believers hide the light the Lord has given us in his word in the clay pot of our humanity. That's convicting to me, and honestly, I hope it is to you too. Ouch, right? Yes, indeed. We're not a light because we go to church on Sunday morning. And, and especially if, despite going to church on Sunday morning, then Monday through Saturday, what do we regard as the light of our life that guides and governs and commands our emotion and our energy and our attention and how we decide things? You, you, can, you can apply the ethic of, of Scripture, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, as an engineer, right? Because your interactions with people are not controlled by a mathematical formula or an engineer's drawing. You, you, can, you can decide your conduct in the classroom as a teacher and be governed by the kind grace that Jesus taught or choose not to. You can do it at 30, 40,000 feet in the air, can't you? And sometimes... People in, that high in the air may make it more challenging to apply your faith in the situation. Keep the light of your life, the light God has given you in his word, prominently, safely displayed to give maximum illumination, not hidden away in the clay pot of your body, your carnality. <clears throat> If we think about this symbol, the light inside the body, the candle, it lights up what's going on in our mind. We may say to our friends, well, I did this because, but that light on the inside says, I know why you did that, and you know why you did that, the light doesn't allow deception of self very easily, does it? That's the whole purpose of it. That's the whole purpose. In verse 22 of Mark 4, Jesus says, For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. <laughs> We can't hide things in our own selves and our own lives. We, not in the light of God's word, if we're keeping it lit and positioned rightly in our lives, it exposes. There will be a greater danger that comes with this that Jesus will expose later on. But rest assured, God will bring hidden secrets and thoughts to light. He says he will. Verse 24. Take heed what ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you, and then to you that hear shall more be given. <clears throat> it's interesting. What we hear goes where when we hear it? Straight to the mind. There, I'm curious, so are all of us probably. So we hear something different on the radio, on the television, from people we talk to, and we're curious, we evaluate it. But how do we evaluate it? Do we evaluate it in light of what scripture says? Or in light of personal opinion and personal preferences, I like, I want. What do we do to shine the light on what we hear? 
<clears throat> when I was working in the insurance business, I often had to drive throughout the LA basin for appointments with clients. I would always keep the, you know, the, the button on my car radio uh, set for Christian radio stations in the LA area. I would hear and listen. There were, there were preachers that they didn't believe in salvation by grace the way I do and the way I believe scripture teaches, but they would teach wonderful truths about practical application of Christian truth to their lives. I seldom agreed with Chuck Swindoll on Bible doctrine, except one time he went through the book of Romans and, and what he did with Romans chapter 9 could be preached in any primitive Baptist pulpit in the country, and people would be saying amen to it. But most of the time when he got into doctrine, he was a little more toward the compromise, part man and part God, salvation with a hybrid idea. But when he got into how you put the leather to the road of your life, he had wonderful teachings and wonderful insights. I listened to him to gain whatever he had to say on those things. And I, I would hear other people, and I would listen to them for a while, and pretty soon I discovered that they were so skewed in their teaching from Scripture that I was... I'm driving down the freeway in Los Angeles traffic. It's not the best place to be listening to somebody and you're arguing with him because you don't agree with him. <laughs> you better keep your focus on the car and you're driving. So I would simply tune into something else when he came on after I discovered him. Take heed what you hear. Once you understand some things are contrary to Scripture, there is no good Bible reason to keep letting that stuff go into your mind. Stop listening to it. <clears throat> now, there's a, there's a little twist. If we got, by the way, this lesson is, I, I referenced it in... Matthew, and we're looking at Mark, <clears throat> you find it also in Luke 8. What Luke says is pretty much the same as what Mark wrote, the same focus on the light in the house. But he did something different in Luke 8, verse 18. Mark says, take heed what ye hear. Luke's record in Luke 8:18, 8, Jesus says, Take heed therefore how ye hear. Both are true. If you're listening to something that's not according to scripture, the wisest course you can take in the gospel of Jesus Christ is to stop listening. When you hear the truth, Verified by scripture, how do you hear it? Oh, that's, uh, that's nice. That was a good sermon. Okay, on Wednesday, what was the preacher's text on Sunday? What were the points he made? Well, I don't remember, but he sure preached a good one. <laughs> you, you're not taking heed how you hear, are you? I, I greatly favor. And frankly, when I'm listening to preaching, I keep a notebook with my Bible. So I make notes to, to remind me and to study later, later. Don't take notes if you never go back and look at them. But if you go back and use those notes to study and to dig deeper into scripture, then take those notes. Don't mind writing in the margin of your Bible and underscoring words to remind you to heed how you hear, hear as a conscientious believer who wants to practice what you hear. Take it to heart. Don't trivialize it. That's what Jesus says. Well, what is this like? Not really a, a great doubt about it. In, Proverbs, in Psalms 119, there are significantly over a hundred verses in the 119th psalm every verse contains one or more words that relate to scripture to the word of god in one way or in statutes of god the law of god the word of god 
Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. It shines on my feet. So if I'm walking down the path and there's a rock, I see it instead of blindly stumbling and falling over it. I can avoid it because I'm walking by the light. It also is a light to my path that says, this is the way, walk this way. It means don't walk that way some other time. Walk this way. Proverbs 6, 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. <clears throat> I want to spend my last segment from the 50th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 50, verses 10 and 11. Isaiah is my favorite Old Testament prophet. Isaiah 50, verse 10. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Does that seem like a contradiction? You study the Bible. You're here every Sunday. Do you ever, about Wednesday or Thursday, even though you're looking and spending time with your Bible on a daily basis, do you ever face something in the middle of the week that just baffles you no end and you can't figure out what to do and how to do it? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Me too. Yes. You're doing the right thing, but something comes along that hits you on the blind side. And it's like you're, you're, you're fearing God. You're obeying the voice of his word in scripture and the voice of what is preached to you. But you still realize on this occasion, you're more in darkness than in light. Have you been there? Yep, me too. What did we do? Give up? That's the human answer. Give up and walk away. No, that's not what Isaiah says. Let him trust in the name, the character, the person. of. You made a point that Jesus is trustworthy and dependable in your prayer. Amen. That's what this means. You can, even when you feel completely enshrouded in darkness, despite trying every way you can to walk in the light, you can trust him. I love in Chronicles of Narnia the guide's description of Aslan. He's safe, but he's not tame. Don't you dare think of God or Jesus as a pet on a leash to, to entertain you at your beck and call. He's too big for that. He's too good for that. He's not a pet, but he's safe. You can trust him. Let him trust in the name, character of, his, of the Lord, and stay. Don't occasionally experiment with him. Stay on his God, even when you're in the dark. When I first, 67 years ago, started speaking in the church, my uncle, who at that time had been preaching and pastoring for between 40 and 50 years, took me under his wing. I spent lots of hours with him trying to learn everything I could. And one of his first sage talks with me said, Joe, every time you walk in the pulpit, Every time you open your Bible and take a text, you're not going to have flooding liberty in preaching. 
There will be times when you walk in that pulpit and open your Bible that you will feel like you're in the dark. But you keep your nose in that book and you keep studying that book that even when you feel that darkness, you have enough presence of mind and study of scripture that you can teach the congregation a good profitable spiritual lesson even when you don't have preaching liberty yeah even preachers have moments in the dark and let me tell you something you think it's lonely for you to sit in the pew and not realize the presence and blessing and open and enlightening of the lord let me tell you something being up here and feeling darkness is the biggest lonely, dark place I've ever been in my life. You don't want to be there. That's why I have gray and less and less hair up here than I had as a young man. He's not finished. You trust, you fear, you believe, you follow the Lord. And even as you do that, you walk in darkness and have no light, but he gives us the answer. And then verse 11, there's always those believers who think they have a better way to live their life than God's way. Let's see about that. Behold, all ye that kindle a fire. We're talking about light. Yes, a fire gives warmth in the middle of the night in, in an outside camp in, in the region where these words were written, as well as here. But he's talking about light much more so than warmth. You kindle a fire. You don't want to have the darkness surround you at night. That Compass yourselves about with sparks. You build a really big one, and it's so big and bustling that sparks fly up from the fire into the sky. <laughs> Walk in the light of your fire. How's that going to work out for you? No matter how big you build the fire, the fire's going to burn out, and you're back where you started in darkness. And in the sparks that ye have kindled, this shall ye have of mine hand. Ye shall lie down in sorrow. You can't get enough firewood to light up the darkness for the rest of your life. It won't last. It will burn out. I remember hearing wise old Texas preacher. Jared, I'm sure you've heard the name Elder O. Strickland from Graham, Texas. I called him a country lawyer preacher. He was a Bible student par excellent. He literally could quote whole chapters of the Bible and not miss a word. And he could preach what they taught. When he was preaching one of the first times I heard him on that passage in 1 Corinthians 3 where you, you're going to have fire in your life. You're going to have heat. You're going to have pressure. You're going to have those pressure cooker moments under the fire. In, in that gravelly country tone, he made a wise observation. Every believer needs a burnout once in a while. You and I are too accustomed to adding hay and wood and stubble stuff to our life that doesn't stand the test. The test of scripture, the test of what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, his example as well as his teaching. Yeah, we do need a burnout once in a while. Jesus makes a fascinating point, and it relates to the, to the very lesson in Isaiah. He that hath, 
We're talking about a light, a candle on a candlestick, right? That's the lesson. To him shall be given. And he that hath not, he snuffed out or ignored the light and let it go out or put it in a bushel. To him shall, or from him shall be taken even that which he hath. Again, this is discipleship, not losing your eternal salvation. Jesus is telling us something we need to hear. We have the light of life. We have an amazing light. Remember what David wrote: "Thy word is a lamp unto my a light and a lamp unto my path, and a light unto my feet." This is the light we need in our decisions, in our belief about God, in our belief about salvation. <laughs> if you have an experience that you came close. By writing the simple reality of Acts chapter 10, you get people who say they believe this book who ridicule the very thing you wrote about it right from the word. We need to not ridicule what this book says. It should be the one that governs our faith beginning to end. That's light. And when we look at this book and make up our own mind in contradiction of its teachings, we have put our candle in a bushel, snuffed it out, and we're walking in the sparks of our own fire, which will not last. You have it? Well, preacher, I just, I don't have as much as I want. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. That's a blessing. It means you have a good reason to dig deeper, to work harder at your study of the Word of God. There's a difference. You folks at Bellflower hear me all the time, know what I'm going to say. There's a difference between speed reading Scripture and studying it. If you were taking a master's degree in the Sermon on the Mount, would you speed read it and say, I'm ready for the final exam? Yeah, you'll get a failing grade. That's a fire burning out. But you, you did. You would dig and you would dig deep to learn the details of what Jesus taught. That's what Jesus is saying here. You hear it? How does this apply to me? How does this impact the decisions I have to make this week, this month, this year? We're beginning 2023. Most people who made New Year's resolutions, resolutions have already broken them and forgotten them. But how, what, what are we going to think about 2023 in December of this year? We have a golden opportunity before us. We can walk in a light that never disappoints, that never fails, never does. Or we can create our own campfire. Well, this one question still looming out there that I raised at the beginning, how do we go from a candle in a house to a light on a hill. If you take genuine believers in Christ in this church, take our candle and hold it. And believers in another church, take your candle and hold it. And we all don't go our separate ways and say, well, but we're just showing Christian liberty. <laughs> That's not what Paul did to the Galatian churches, is it? No, that's putting out your light and saying, I still have it. But when we take the light and we protect the light and we love the light and we trust the light and we walk in the light, and then you and I, you and you and you and you and you, putting our light together is a lot brighter than one light in one house. And when all God's children join together and walk up the hill, ever drawing closer, 
to the source of light, the light giver himself. Only in that way do we become the light of the world. <laughs> and it's not only across the Pacific Ocean, it's here too. When Christians nitpick and bickersmith and fuss at each other and fault find and go their separate ways, we can't be the light that we say we want to be. You've got to work to do what Paul said the gospel does. It's to be preached till we all come together in the unity of the faith unto a perfect, mature, full-grown man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's the light. And only when we do that do we have any hope of being that big light on a hill. We got to start at our house. <laughs> And make sure our light is well trimmed and well supplied with oil and located in the right place in our house to do its work there before we can start the process of being the light of the world. Let's start right there and do our best. God bless you. Amen.